This episode contains discussion of sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. Women throughout New Jersey and Philadelphia were being targeted by a serial killer hiding in plain sight. Using charm, technology, and deceit, he lured them from the company of friends and family, then discarded their bodies without detection. Even when one of the victims managed to provide police with more than enough information to track him down, he remained free to continue his hunt. This week's episode is Serial Killer Khalil Wheeler Weaver, Part 1. Up, bump in the night, your heart fills with dread, probably a murderer who wants you dead. It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse. Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse. It's hopeless, you're doomed. You'd call a priest if you could. You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood. I'm gonna kill you. Well, this is a bummer of a story. It's definitely harrowing to hear somebody survive, but then it is repeatedly disappointing to hear how much we think oh i'm with my friends i'll be safe i'll just take a photo of something or i'll just note down who they were with and then when you see that even despite having that information the apathy of those who might be maybe could do something about it it tends to make you feel uh disappointed with the system as it stands uh we're gonna see that Women that are in the sex work business are not taken seriously and, in fact, often blamed and just treated like they're beneath everyone and not human when horrible things happen to them. Definitely. And you talk about the less dead, and that's definitely this normally type of victim is not what you're going to see on the news, not what you're seeing people, you know, searching for. They're watching, you know, they're going to cover it on court TV or whatever. It's more... Oh, well, you know. They're the drudges of society. Who's going to miss them? They weren't contributing anything anyways when that's not the case. They all have loving families, friends that care a lot about them. So, yeah, we'll get into this one. I had not heard of this serial killer until you mentioned him, Heather. And we always like to cover cases that maybe aren't as well known, especially when it involves marginalized communities being targeted that don't get as much that aren't talked about as much so glad to do this one. Oh, definitely we've been looking to do it this was one we were researching back mm-hmm. when we were on tour last summer mm-hmm. and i remember reading about a lot of this on planes we've been collecting data researching things like that but it's just with the production schedule it's like when will we be able to cover it so i'm glad all of our because it, it was one of those where you like can't stop reading about it because it is so it's almost unbelievable and then you realize that no it's very believable and the frightening thing is how often is this happening right in many other communities and this case which more more so in part two but you do see it also with the the victims in part one where it's going to take friends family members people advocating on behalf of the person rather than the traditional power structures that are supposed to protect you but in these cases repeatedly failed over and over again and even those in power were like yeah in hindsight we very much failed we've seen that a lot where the law enforcement doesn't want to take the case or continue the investigation and it falls to the parents of the victims that just refuse to let it go Mm -hmm. understandably and they're the ones inevitably that bring justice to their loved ones they are they are well yeah this is one like we always say some of the episodes we cover are funny and we have a fun wacky time this one's a lot more serious and uh discussing well like we said in the content warning up top sexual assault, violence, violence against sex workers, particularly black women, and police brutality in the sense of apathy. So just a heads up that, you know, when we say some episodes like Bigfoot will be funny ones, this one will be a more serious one. Well, if you want something funny, though, before we get into this harrowing tale, we are going to go on tour soon. Yes. Yes, and the, the the full moon energy tour is lunar themed. We're going to talk about just all types of macabre things, but keeping it on the lighter side. So then when we do studio episodes, we can tackle this more serious subject matter. But if you go to sinisterhood.com slash live shows, all the cities are uh, available. They're on sale now is the time you're hearing this. And 
there's going to be more cities uh, released soon. So Mm -hmm. like we always do a couple of serious episodes in a row and then have something uh, as a palate cleanser, something lighter for our mental health. Uh, that's that's kind of what the tour will be for us. And mm-hmm. then the, the the episodes in studio that you'll hear, still going to be one. So we like to tackle systemic issues, which I think there are a lot, a lot, a lot in this in this episode. I agree. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. Khalil Wheeler Weaver was born April 20th, 1996. He graduated from East Orange Campus High School and in 2016 was a student in, at Essex County College. He was 20 years old, living at home, and working as a grocery store security guard, but had considered becoming a police officer, according to All That's Interesting. His Google search history even included police entrance exam practice test. However, it also included searches like how to make homemade poisons to kill humans and what chemical could you put on a rag and hold to someone's face to make them go to sleep immediately. In late summer 2016, Wheeler Weaver would go beyond the online searches and act on the information he found. And that's uh, disturbing about this case is the digital trail will start seeing that there's all manner of digital evidence. And I think when I hear that a crime has happened and you're like, we can't figure out who's doing this. My first question is, oh, well, everybody has a tracker in their pocket called a cell phone. You know, whose phone was pinging during this time or what did people search for? No, I mean, you'll see if nobody's looking into that stuff, it's really easy to just operate in plain sight. Yeah. Robin Daphne Michelle West was born September 5th, 1995. Family and friends described her as fun loving in an online memorial. According to the local Philadelphia NPR channel, Robin was a typical tempestuous teenager with a beautiful singing voice and a love for making people laugh. After suffering the loss of a close family member, she considered a second mom. Robin began spending more time out of the house, sometimes not contacting her parents for a couple of days at a time. She would always return, though, so her parents didn't worry too much if they hadn't heard from her for a few days, according to multiple interviews. Robin told her family she was headed out on August 31st, 2016, to celebrate her birthday a little early, according to WHYY News. She was 19 years old at the time, just days shy of turning 20. That night, Robin was out with her close friend, Bernicia Patterson. Police later uncovered evidence that the women were engaged in sex work that night, though Robin's father has cast out, telling NPR. There's nothing to prove that that's what she was doing. She may have been friends with somebody who was doing that. That doesn't necessarily mean she was doing that. And you understand, as a parent, you don't want to accept that that might have been happening. And regardless, it's just... It doesn't matter why she was out there, but if this serial killer, about to be serial killer, is looking out, okay, well, who can I go and pick up thinking, oh, well, they may not have contacts, they may not have connections or people looking out for them. He driving up and down Mm -hmm. the street, seeing who he could pick up. Targeting people that he thinks are on the fringe of society that aren't going to be missed if they go missing. Mm -hmm. Regardless of why the women were out that night. They were approached on the street by a baby-faced young man who offered to give Robin a ride. Used to looking out for one another, Bernicia snapped a photo of the man's license plate, then told him playfully, Take care of my sister. According to North Jersey Magazine, she also stored the man's phone number in her phone just to be sure. As Robin drove away with the new man, Bernicia did not realize she would be the last person to see Robin alive. And at this time, it's 2016, so he's just barely 20, 20 and some months years old, and has a round, chubby, kind of, you know, chubby little cheeks, has a boyish, very young look. looking. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, thin, tallish build, but thin, but, you know, oh, very charming, oh, overtly, come on, hang out, let's mm-hmm. go out, not get in the car right now. It's not what would make you put your guard up normally, not taking an offensive position like they're going to jump on you. Just, well, if you, you can get in if you want. If not, that's okay. He looks very young, unassuming, doesn't look particularly strong, you know, so... Mm-hmm probably look like someone that they didn't think was gonna gonna be a problem although bernicia being street smart you never know don't judge a book by its cover so did her due diligence by getting his number and a picture of his license plate you would think that would help people later but only if you're taken seriously 
Exactly. You do everything that we think. If you and I were going somewhere and you were going to get separated and go with somebody, I would say, okay, let me get your number or let me take a picture of you or let, something identifying. Mm-hmm. So it's everything you would do in a situation like this, thinking exactly what you said. You'll you'll go to the police later. They'll listen. Mm. After leaving the area, the man, later identified as Khalil Wheeler Weaver, drove Robin to an abandoned house located on Lakeside Avenue in nearby Orange. There, he raped her, then strangled her. When he was finished, he used an accelerant and lit her body on fire, causing a full blaze at the abandoned house. Neighbors called 911 in the early hours of September 1st to report the two-alarm fire. Footage from that night shows smoke billowing high into the dark sky. Once the fire was extinguished, first responders found a corpse inside. This is such a high profile way to dispose of a body that you now have a ton of first responders on the scene. News crews were on the scene. There's footage of this fire on YouTube there. I mm-hmm. mean, it was a huge billowing smoke that one would wonder, did you why would you put that much attention on yourself if you've just committed a heinous act? And Either it goes to, you know, lack of thinking in advance, foresight in advance, but or just the blatantness of this is an abandoned house. I can do whatever I want in this town. Who cares? You know, I'll burn it down. Houses burn down around here all the time. Nobody cares. I think a lot of it would be destroying evidence too. Mm-hmm. thinking that, well, if the body is unrecognizable, it's going to be harder to identify or any of fingerprints or DNA would be destroyed. So It's effective in that sense, but yes, it causes a lot of people to call the cops and a lot of attention drawn to something that otherwise nobody would have paid attention to until somebody walked inside and perhaps saw her. And found that. Well, and this, she's left in a house and set on fire, which is what you would do with something. He treats everybody sort of like garbage, Mm -hmm. right? Just leave it. Oh, just ditch it in the house and set it on fire. Mm -hmm. He has, I mean, not that he had any respect for for him before, but when we've covered other serial killers, it's like, oh, what are they, what are their plans? What is their motive? Are they taking this person to, like, you know, Ted Bundy kept the corpses and Mm -hmm. would go back and revisit them? He just... It seems like the act is what he's focused on, and then when he's done, he's done. Yeah. It's 6 a.m. on September 1st, 2016. Robin's friend Bernicia headed to the Newark police station to report her friend missing. Bernicia was able to provide a physical description and license plate information, but authorities didn't follow up at the time. Robin was only missing, and police had not yet identified the body found in the house fire. Meanwhile, Robin's parents texted and called their daughter repeatedly as her birthday approached. They never heard back. It took several days for the medical examiner to identify the body inside the burned home using dental records. It was Robin West. On September 13, 2016, the authorities called Robin's mother, Anita, to break the tragic news. According to interviews with Robin's parents, Anita then called Robin's father, Leroy, telling him, They found Robin. Feeling hopeful, Leroy told reporters that he replied, Let's go get her. Robin's mother clarified, heartbroken, saying, No, they found the body. Leroy told reporters from NJ.com that he was so devastated, he hit the wall, slid down to the floor, and wailed so loudly he was sure the neighbors heard him. Hearing them talk, I mean, it's just... You don't expect to lose a child ever, but right around her birthday and her saying, I'm just going to go out with friends. I'll just be right back. Talk to you guys in a few days. He has since become a huge proponent of caring for other parents who have gone through the loss of a child to murder and tried to turn that into something good. But in that moment right there, all you can think is, you know, your world is shattered. Everything's shut down. Yeah, absolutely. And then. Anytime something like that happens around a holiday or a birthday, it's every time that comes up each year, it's like double painful. Mm -hmm. We've seen a lot that parents that lose their kids, they do try to make something of it so that their murder wasn't in vain by reaching out to other families and starting support groups. I hope he's found some solace and comfort in in that and meeting other people that have gone through similar things. It's, It's absolutely awful that anybody has to do that. But I'm glad that he hopefully has found some some kind of closure and comfort. Police questioned Khalil in the days following the discovery of Robin's body, as he was the last one seen with her. Detectives described him as 
calm and helpful. According to WAPT News, he was treated as a witness who was voluntarily cooperating with authorities and not considered a suspect at that time. He told police the two had had dinner before he dropped her off at a house near the site of the fire. He was not arrested at the time. I, aside from his demeanor, which would be the only reason why I, I just, it's bizarre to me that they did, that they just bought the story whole hog and said, okay, you dropped her off. So you must not have, I mean, I guess he yeah. had no re- record and was. No, you know, up until this, he had no record. He, and he had several family members that were in law enforcement. Like we said, he even considered going into law enforcement, which we've seen that too with people that you know, have a predilection for these types of things, kind of want to get into the law enforcement side to almost learn more about how to cheat the system or, you know, be able to hide evidence or kind of see it from that angle. But yeah, he went from having no record to doing the most heinous acts imaginable. And that it might be because, you know, you're on the force for however long and you look at it and go, Oh, well, he's a 20-year-old kid. There's no way he went from zero to serial mm-hmm. killer. But sometimes, I mean... Maybe check the car for some hair samples, some DNA, you know? Run the phone. See, maybe yeah. if his phone pinged at the site of the... And this is not like it was the 70s. This is 2016. Right. And he used his phone a lot. And when we get to the trial, you'll see there was significant evidence that could have been uncovered easily at the time. But instead, you just go, well, there's, it's not, not likely. Well, and Bernicia goes to the cops. They know that she's a sex worker. They don't take her as seriously. Even yeah. if they do, if they think, well, you know, you two ladies were out there that night. So you kind of had it coming to you if something happened. That's kind of the attitude of law enforcement throughout this whole case. Yeah, and you see, and it should make all of us angry that we all pay taxes. We're all part of this system. We deserve to have to get help as well. And if you go and report a crime, it's not like, well, I need a background on the person that this happened to to know whether I care or should follow up or not. It's just a thing happened. What can we do to fix it or, you know, look into it? Not are they worthy enough of me trying to find out what happened to them? That's not how it works. They're humans. They're all worthy. We're all we're all entitled to the same rights. Ideally, unfortunately, we see time and time again, that is not at all how it works. Yeah, absolutely. Sinisterhood will be right back. With HelloFresh, you get pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. No matter your lifestyle or meal preferences, HelloFresh has recipes sure to please everyone at your table. From fit and wholesome to veggie to family friendly, you'll always find something for even the pickiest eaters. They can enjoy it too. HelloFresh's latest line of meals featuring robust flavors and filling portions are ready in less than 15 minutes. Enjoy taste and quality done quick with recipes like falafel power bowls, seared steak and potatoes with Bernays sauce, or Southwest pork and bean burritos. Yes, please. We're always trying to find fast and good meals because who wants to spend a ton of time cooking when there's only so many hours in the days to do stuff and when you got two small kids? It's not easy a lot of the times. These are a lifesaver for us. We know that everyone's getting a well-balanced meal, but also it's super fast. Fast, easy, and good. You can't beat any of Mm -hmm. that. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Creepy65 and use code Creepy65 for 65% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash Creepy65 and use code Creepy65 for 65% off plus free shipping. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Joanne Brown was 33 years old in 2016 when she encountered Khalil Wheeler Weaver just 52 days after he had killed Robin West. According to loved ones, Joanne had a heart of gold. Her friends described her to Hulu as part of a chosen family, a beautiful woman who was happy, vibrant, and had a bubbly personality with ambitions of becoming a model. However, Joanne had endured significant physical and sexual abuse while growing up in the foster system and eventually turned to sex work to make ends meet. On the night of October 22nd, she was standing with a friend outside of Popeye's Chicken on the south side of Newark, New Jersey, when a charming man in a BMW rolled by around 1 p.m. and offered to take her on a date, Joanne agreed. Sadly for Joanne, that would be the last time she was seen alive. Again, he rolls up. 
He's a good looking kid in a nice car saying, yeah, I'm going to go on a date. Let's let's go. I think his youth helped him here. Oh, for sure. And especially, you know, Robin West, it helped him in two different ways, because when he preys on the women that are close to his age, you see him as a peer and you go, oh, well, he's a peer like me. I'm young. He's young. And then in this case, Joanne Brown's 33 and I'm 36. And if a 19, 20 year old kid wants to come up and talk to me, your brain's still like, you're still a kid, man. You're a baby. You know, you're yeah. still a kid. He's not. I mean, he's fully responsible for all of his actions, but we just get that gut feeling too. And if you, you know, you have family members that age or friends that age, you're like, oh, you're the age of my little cousin mm-hmm. or my brother or my neighbor that you just come, you just catalog it in your head as we all do, you know, evolutionarily looking out for threats of, oh, I categorize you as a young person and you look familiar. So, you know, just in far, insofar as, you know, you look like a, a little buddy. You're less you threatening. Just go, yeah. It's no big deal. And I'll, I'll go with you with no, you know, without knowing where they're going. Having allowed a friend to borrow her phone, Joanne had no phone with her when she drove away with the young man in the BMW. Joanne borrowed the driver's phone to call her friend Amina and let her know she was safe. Joanne didn't know at the time she was not safe, as the man who had picked her up was Khalil Wheeler Weaver. He drove her to an abandoned house just six blocks from where he lived with his parents. There, he raped and strangled her before leaving her body in the abandoned home. Six blocks from where he lives is, I guess if you commit this crime initially, you speak to police and get away with it. You think, oh, yeah, I can. This is I'll get away with it again. And you don't mind utilizing the area even closer to your house. You're probably more familiar with it. So you feel a little more comfortable, like you know your way around more. This is where we kind of see his M.O. start to arise. He picks up sex workers takes them to an abandoned house, rapes them, and then strangles them often with their own clothes. Most of these women were found with like their own pants around their neck or a jacket or a shirt. So he doesn't have anything with him either in the car when they get in that, you know, they're like, look suspicious because he uses their own items to kill them. Yeah, and it's less, again, it's just something that if you get in the car and he's got a duffel bag or a crowbar or something in the mm-hmm. seat, you're, you're like, ah, my Or the seat's flag. missing, like Bundy. Yeah, but your red flags don't go up because, again, it's a nice car and you think, mm-hmm. oh, well, there's he's not doesn't have anything on him that's going to make me, you know, feel like I'm going to get attacked. And, you know, it's very bold that he allowed her, knowing what his intention was when picking her up, to use his phone. Mm -hmm. That's again, I think this boldness of, I'm not going to get caught. They don't care. The police don't care. Or he's being, it's why it's a tactic of, well, I'll gain her trust even further by letting her use my phone to show that I'm not a threat. And that's, I think gaining the trust becomes part of the MO as well. Later that day, no one had heard from Joanne. Friends began to worry. Then Amina's phone rang. It was the number Joanne had called from earlier. Amina answered, but this time, it wasn't her friend's voice on the other line. It was simply silence. Amina tried making contact, but the call ended. That's so eerie. It's eerie and also, it feels intentional, kind of like, or like we said, instead of going back to visit, you know, the area where you may have buried your victims, he's kind of still trying to have, get get into that, weird disgusting space that they get into of of the thrill of it and oh they they don't know what i've done and hearing the fear and you know just it's like playing with them it's mind games yeah when she of course she's gonna answer and go joanne is that you hello where's my friend at that terror Mm -hmm. deriving joy out of since the act is already now over a you check up and see we've already called the cops or what are they gonna say and if it's just desperation sadness you might think oh well i have you know i'm not going to get caught again i'm going to get away with it the next day joanne's friends went to the newark police to report their friend missing police ignored their request for help and never followed up instead they asked joanne's friends well was she a streetwalker joanne's friend ashley told interviewers from hulu everybody deserves help police don't care about women like that they feel like women like that put themselves in a predicament Even though Joanne's friends could provide officers with a phone number of the last person Joanne was seen with, they were turned away. With no help from police, her friends sprung into action. They searched jails, psych wards, and hospitals looking for their friend, 
but had no luck. Six weeks later, Joanne's body was found in the abandoned house. She had been strangled with her own clothes. And you see the importance and value of community and caring for each other in communities that are largely ignored by power systems where nobody else is going to follow up. All right, fine. Give me the phone. And it's you're now double victimizing the family members and friends who can't even grieve what happened, can't even be sit in their own concern about what happened, but now have to shove that down and pick up a phone and now start doing a bunch of work, which they do happily, not happily, but they do gratefully that at least we're here to care about her. But it is double victimizing people when you're now having to not only shoulder the emotional burden, but you're also having to shoulder the literal burden of investigation. Yeah, which is a full-time job and what police are paid to do. So you'd think that they should be doing it, not a grieving friend. Yeah, exactly. Sinisterhood will be right back. Helix Sleep is a premium mattress brand that provides tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences. The Helix lineup includes 14 unique mattresses, including a collection of luxury models, a mattress for big and tall sleepers, and even a mattress made just for kids that has been awarded Best Mattress Winner by Parents Magazine. But here's the great question. How do you know which Helix mattress works for you and your body? I got you. Take the Helix Sleep Quiz. We both did it. You find your perfect mattress in under two minutes. When we took the quiz, I got matched with the Moonlight Lux model because I needed something that I'm a flip flopper sleeper. I go side, sometimes stomach, same with Paris. So I needed something that was adaptable, but that also provided enough support when I move around all night. I got the Sunset Lux because I'm primarily a side sleeper, but also I'm not trying to deal with motion transfer from Tommy flopping around or if I got a kid in the bed. So they can do whatever they want. And I don't even notice because it's it's just smooth sailing baby everybody is unique though so helix offers models with memory foam layers to provide optimal pressure relief if you sleep on your side models with a more responsive foam to cradle your body for essential support in stomach and back sleeping positions plus enhanced cooling features that help regulate your body temperature whatever the season may be we can't be hot sleepers we can't take Mm -mm. it And not only is the Helix mattress the best we've ever slept on, we love it, we miss it when we're not on it, but the setup is also fast and easy. It's delivered right to your door in a box for free. By supporting Helix, you're also allowing them to support us and our show. Helix is offering up to 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash creepy. This is their best offer yet, and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Tiffany Taylor grew up in public housing in Jersey City, New Jersey. For a time, she studied music engineering and psychology at Valencia College in Orlando, Florida, according to Cinemaholic, with an eye toward a career in the music industry. But she eventually moved back to New Jersey. In November of 2016, at 33 years old, she was living in the Ritz Motel in Elizabeth, New Jersey. She was several months pregnant with her second child and in need of some cash to maintain her living situation. Tiffany's friend introduced her via text to Khalil Wheeler Weaver as a person who needed a ride in exchange for gas money. Soon, Khalil was texting Tiffany every two to three days asking for sex. She told reporters from NJ.com that she believed his repeated messages were an effort to gain her trust. And there you see, again, choosing someone who he, you know, the friend of a friend that introduces him. I'm sure, tells him about her background, that she has a precarious living situation, she needs money, and his instinct or sense of, oh, that's a target, that's mm-hmm. prey, that's somebody that is I can prey on, like the previous two victims who were either sex work or out looking for a date, where he thinks, oh, well, I can trade sex for money, and then they'll have to come with me. That takes away the, do I have to lure them and be charming? And for her trying to gain that trust again of, well, of course, he's not a bad person because my friend introduced us and I've been texting him every few days. Mm -hmm. So you let your guard down even more because you're like, oh, yeah, I mean, I don't know him super well, but yeah, we, you know, we have shared acquaintances and I've been messaging him so we can get a hold of him at least. It's just all these ways for as young as he was to have that here are elements that he could implement in order to get them in a position where he could fully take advantage of them he knew their vulnerabilities he played to those and knew the buttons that he could push that were that were going to work her in several interviews she gives different details and one i saw 
her mother had been struggling with ovarian cancer, so their money had gone to that. So they were unhoused and kind of living from hotel to hotel at the time. And so, yeah, she's a couple months pregnant. That's going on. He offers her $100 cash to, to drive him somewhere. So she's like, yeah, I, I took him up on it. Yeah, why wouldn't you? If you that you're literally the hundred dollars could be between you not having a place to live right. and having to go and spend the night on the street. Something as easy as give me a ride somewhere, you'd say yeah. She finally agreed to meet him and give him a ride the night of November fifteenth, twenty sixteen. To get to Khalil, she borrowed a car from a friend she was staying with at the motel and left her cell phone back in the room. Approaching Khalil at their meeting spot. Tiffany noticed that he was wearing a ski mask and gloves. He got in the car, telling her he was cold, which explained his accessories. In an interview on Hulu's How I Caught My Killer, Tiffany said, He was a tall guy, kind of slim, and he had on like a ski mask that fully covered his face, and he had on gloves. I didn't think this was strange because everybody in Newark and Jersey City area, all the guys, they wear ski masks and gloves when it starts to get cold. Which... Again, it's the perfect, it's like hiding in plain sight. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm just wearing this because it's cold outside. The pair drove for several minutes before Khalil told her he needed to use the bathroom and also asked Tiffany for a cigarette. She agreed to pull over. Once the car was no longer moving, Tiffany lost consciousness. She told interviewers. He was really quiet. I parked the car, I gave him the cigarette, and everything just went kind of black at that point. All I remember is waking up in the backseat to him raping me and choking me out at the same time. He would choke her out until the point of unconsciousness, but each time she would wake up. He choked her three or four times as she fought him by trying to scratch his face. Khalil tried reasoning with her, telling her if she would cooperate, he would let her go. She continued to fight, so he finally handcuffed her and covered her mouth in duct tape. Tiffany told interviewers, That's when I said to myself, wow, this is not just stopping at rape. This guy wants to kill me. Well, and based on his Google search of what's something you could put over somebody's face to make them go unconscious immediately, it sounds like he found an answer because yeah. she just parks the car and then all of a sudden you wake up in the back seat. That's just a literal nightmare where you think he's going to get out and, you know, go on the side of the road to go to the bathroom or whatever. And instead, you that's you wake up and she was describing, you know, his arm was around her chest holding her down. I mean, she couldn't wriggle away and you're groggy in and out of consciousness from the drugs and also from being choked yeah she said she wasn't sure what exactly happened she thought she also may have been hit in the back of the head because her head was sore she also in another interview said that when this was going on he took off his ski mask and at that point he said you don't recognize me and she realized that she had met him a couple years prior and had stolen some money from him, and she feels like she may have been targeted because he was trying to get uh, money back from her. Well, and yeah, and if they did have a run-in, he just maybe kept a mental note of, oh, mm -hmm. I met her. That might be another person I could target, especially if the way they were connected, he hears she's in a bad way. Yeah. As Khalil drove, Tiffany lay terrified in the back seat, bound and gagged. She told reporters from NJ.com later. I wasn't planning on dying that day. My every thought was to get away. My every thought. Or kill both of us. But it wasn't him getting away. No. Tiffany's tears, sweat, and saliva loosen the adhesive of the duct tape. Desperate to survive and save herself and her unborn child, Tiffany made a vow to herself. I was going to put up a fight to the end. If he was going to kill me, he had to die too. I wasn't beat. And I wonder if... Having being a mom already and also being pregnant that you have not that everybody doesn't have this survival instinct, but we you hear over and over again about parents having some sort of extra strength, you know, that they go into this mode of we all want to save ourselves, but something you could probably speak. Well, it's not just about me. you at that point. You've got an, another life that you're caring for. So. You're, you go into, yeah, protection mode, and it becomes about something bigger than yourself. With a few moves of her jaw, Tiffany freed her mouth and could talk. She thought fast and mentioned her cell phone. She had left it back at the motel, and all of the pair's messages were on there. She told Khalil that the police would inevitably find him using their conversations. 
She also reminded him that the car they were in belonged to her friend back at the motel. He'd soon notice they were gone and would come looking for her. Tiffany was convincing, and a panicked Khalil drove them back to the motel. And that's more survival instinct of, okay, what can I work with? And knowing he probably doesn't want to get caught, given he's ready to dispose of a witness, which is you, you start to say, what are my bargaining chips? And that's very genius to bring that up mm-hmm. and say, oh, well, you want to get caught? Because guess what? He's going to be asking for his car. They're going to check my phone. Th- meanwhile, I'm given his previous interactions with police, it is interesting that he was motivated by this because he had had been reported to police twice before, yeah. spoken to him once. It's surprising that he was concerned about that, but maybe just given that it was a whole car he was going to have to return, that that convinced him. But that's good chips to play uh, if you have them. She said in the Hulu interview she was very street smart. Obviously, she was. When I was first reading about all of this, I thought, oh, no, girl, don't leave your phone in the motel. But that's what ended up saving her life. So perhaps she knew, you know, even subconsciously, like, if I leave this here, this gives me a reason to have to come back here or track, you know, tracks me to something. It's some sort of evidence somebody could give him. I'm very shocked, too, that this worked. I thought he would just say, fuck it and and not care. But it, it worked and he drove them back there. That's a good point. And if you're you're right, if you think, oh, well, this is the one thing that proves that who I've been talking to and where I'm about to be. Yeah, you don't want to have that vulnerable with this person you're about to be with thinking, oh, well, they might take it and smash it or he might steal it or whatever. Then you just say, oh, let me leave it in the room. That's my trail of breadcrumbs back to safety. Well, and she told him, if you drive me back, I won't tell anybody and I'll give you the phone. So Mm -hmm. then, you know, you have the phone. So he thinks that that's what's going to happen when they get back. Surveillance footage shows the pair returning to the Ritz. Tiffany convinced Khalil to remove the rest of the duct tape so her friend in the room wouldn't get suspicious. She also agreed to remain handcuffed. But what Khalil didn't know was Tiffany was double jointed. While still in the car, she had wriggled one wrist free. Hiding her free hand, she darted quickly into the motel room, locking Khalil out. She got inside, slammed the door, and locked it behind her. Telling her friend what happened, he called 911. Meanwhile, Khalil was at the door, pounding from the outside. Tiffany drew back the curtain on the room's window and held her hands up, showing that she had freed herself. Surveillance footage shows him ducking his head down, turning, and running away from the motel. And the footage is horrifying because you do see it's a further away shot of him in front of the room standing in front of the and you just see the demeanor change between this aggressive thinking he's got still has the upper hand and could maybe still get back control of the situation. And then definitely he retreats. His head goes down. He turns and runs off to retreat because he knows he's been beat. Yeah. He may have seen the other person in the room, too, when she opened the window. Oh, exactly. And hiding the cuff so that he doesn't know that she's out of the cuff and the luckiness of being double jointed. That's so fortunate. But even without having the cuff off, once you're inside, you know, lock the door, never open it again. Yeah. Um, but you think, OK, oh, thank God I'm home free. Call 911. We'll tell him what happened. I'll give him the guy's name. I'll give him his license plate. I got you and everybody else messages on my phone that track him to where, you know, says everything we've been talking about. Well, and the marks of where she had had duct tape on her mouth. The remaining handcuff that still remained on yes. her wrist. There was significant physical evidence of this attack that had happened that, you you know, you think, oh, they'll get here. I'll tell them what happened and it'll be great. Breathing a sigh of relief, Tiffany waited for police to arrive. However, once officers were on the scene, they didn't treat Tiffany like she had just survived an encounter with a serial rapist and murderer. Instead, they interrogated her aggressively talked over her, and scoffed at her story. When she explained she had been handcuffed and duct taped, one officer shown on body cam footage asked her, So you let him duct tape you? Flames, flames on the side of my face. The audacity. Yeah. And there's two of them, two cops yeah. standing there. One, They're like standing in the door of the hotel room. They can't even be bothered to like, go all the way in, sit down in a chair. She's just survived a rape and a brutal attack. They're just like, so what, 
do you have any marks? And she's like, well, look at my face. You can see where he ripped the duct tape off. Oh, so you let him duct tape you? Let him? Bitch, she said, I'm I was being handcuffed. held down. I'm being raped. What do you mean, let him? Yeah, when he goes, oh, you let him duct tape you, she holds her hand up. She goes, well, I was handcuffed. So no, I didn't. I was literally subdued and handcuffed. And it's like, oh. And just the disdain with which they speak to her. And you just say, God, send anybody else on yeah. that call. Just send anybody else on that call. Send a female officer on that call. Send somebody who's been trained. Or not an officer. Someone who's trained in yes. uh, trauma and s- sexual abuse to go out there and, you know, uh, talk to her like she's a person. Get mm-hmm. her help. Find out the details. They show up to a, a motel in a, you know, bad area to them. They see that she is a sex worker and they're like, ah. So you kind of were asking for this, right? Yes, yeah, like oh, you lived in this motel, and then d- you just you just let him do all this stuff to mm-hmm. you. It's like no, that's not part of any of this. And in fact, this wasn't even a sex worker event. I was, and even if it was, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Consent is consent, and you should listen to my story and m- move accordingly. It's particularly horrifying for her because he knows who she is. Yeah, it's also particularly horrifying that she's pregnant when this whole thing yeah, went down. That definitely that makes me uh, sick to my stomach for sure. And back to the duct tape. Does anyone let somebody duct tape their face? I mean, unless you're on jackass, why would you be letting somebody duct tape your face? You know, I mean, and she says in the Hulu show that he did it like wrapping a present it wasn't just like over her mouth it was like wrapped around her head several times so you know that's all in your hair it's all in your your face and everything it's you're also handcuffed it's a miracle that her sweat and tears and saliva was able to remove that or it would have ended up very differently because she wouldn't have been able to talk her way out of it For sure. And also you think, okay, well, it's just a one piece of duct tape on your mouth. But no, it was all the way around her head. So she was saying as she was crying and sweating and her saliva, she was going like, ah, ah, like opening her jaw to try to just wriggle as much as she could. And but you also think he he's obviously no expert at any of this. He's relatively organized, but in the moment, seemingly uh, frantic, panicked frantic that thank god he didn't duct tape it so much over her nose to where he was suffocating her but it also goes to show you know this is a horrifying that she has to go through this experience thank god she survived but she's it offers a, a glimpse into what his mo was and what he was doing and when he attacks the women it's like it's not just enough that he attacks them he then wants to take them somewhere and abandon that put them in an abandoned spot and maybe kill them in a special spot but he didn't attack her in the back seat kill her in the back seat and then transport her he had attacked her in the back seat subdued her and then was transporting her somewhere else and that's just it's just a fascinating insight into his operations as as he's committing these crimes and why yeah sinisterhood will be right back this show is sponsored by better help Whenever I feel like my best self, it means I got a good night's rest. It means I'm doing my meditation in the morning. I'm taking care of myself. But problem is I get busy. I get out of my routines. And I think I've broken my routine once. I'm over with. I'm hosed. I'm done because I'm such a perfectionist. And what I need is to have the calming voice of my sweet therapist to tell me it's all okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. You're at your best when you're trying your best. We are. And when we're at our best, we can do so many great things. But sometimes, like you said, life gets you bogged down and you may feel overwhelmed or like you're not showing up in the way that you want to. Working with a therapist can help you get closer to the best version of you because when you feel empowered, you feel more prepared to take on everything life throws at you. I use BetterHelp. I love my therapist. She messages me. I message her. If I'm too busy for a session, it's still good that I can check in. She can send me resources and it's all through a secure portal and I never have to leave my home, which I love because unless I really have to, I have become such a homebody. So I love having privacy in my uh, the studios where I do my BetterHelp sessions and I can talk to her anytime we're both available therapy is great it's helpful for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries it empowers you to be the best version of yourself it isn't just for those who've experienced major trauma 
If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, flexible, affordable, and entirely online. Just fill out a brief questionnaire and get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Sinister today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Sinister. In a later interview with NJ.com, Tiffany summed it up. Elizabeth, New Jersey Police Department did not believe me. They thought I was lying. Despite their tone, Tiffany still provided officers her attacker's name, cell phone number, email address, and Facebook profile. Rather than follow up on leads, the police singularly focused on Tiffany's prior sex work, at one point threatening to arrest her for prostitution even as she stood before them, having endured an egregiously violent attack. She told interviewers, I made it so easy for them. They let this guy just walk away. They let him just walk away. Literally. Nobody believed me. The, I can't deal with the frustration with that. I mean, you, murders have been solved with far less evidence than this. And she's giving on a silver platter, here's everything you need to know about this guy. Hey, also, maybe if you looked into this, you're going to trace it back to some other murders that have happened that you guys haven't given a shit about either. And you're going to see that this guy's a serial killer. You'll see that his phone pinged at the location where all these women were picked up mm -hmm. and then their la where their bodies were found. And then he got himself directions with Google Maps on in the between. So you don't have any question of whether he was there. You know he was there and gave himself directions home. You're right. People, they've solved murders on, you know, a single strand of hair that they found somewhere. Mm -hmm. Much less having his name, cell phone number, email, and Facebook profile. And for the average listener who's listening right now, you know, you think, one might think, this would never happen to me or would never what whatever happens to any of us you better for damn sure hope if you have that much evidence you think oh well it'll be solved i'll be safe i won't have to look over my shoulder because this person who just did the worst thing that's ever been done to me is still out and about and knows where i live because he was just here you think oh well obviously they'll go and pick him up i'll feel better but to have the the body cam footage is so frustrating and egregious it makes me apoplectic just to have that. <laughs> All right. Yeah, sure. Give us his name. Whatever. Just total disregard for her as a, a human being. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it always just baffles me in these situations because how it's it's so easy to just follow up on this. Mm -hmm. It's it's more difficult to say, you know what? We don't really give a shit. We're just going to let this go you know i mean maybe not easier for them mentally i guess it is but it's like it doesn't take much for you to look into this and your bias outweighs that so much that you're willing to not take 10 minutes to check this out and and guess what you would have prevented a lot of other horrible shit from happening had you but instead your classism overshadows everything and you think that this person doesn't deserve the rights that if you'd showed up in a rich neighborhood and this was a white woman talking about this oh my god everybody on the force would have been out looking for him it would have been on the news the six o'clock news oh, yeah immediately officers made a grave error in not following up on tiffany's call indeed she had encountered a vicious serial killer and managed to survive had the police listened to her the violent spree may have stopped with Tiffany, but sadly for 19-year-old Sarah Butler, who would encounter Khalil only a week later, he was left to roam free and continue his hunt. So what do we think? I think... I'm so angry about this case. That's why I wanted to cover it. Yeah, it's really sad because it's time and time again, it's the the same person that he is seeking out someone that he thinks is not going to be missed that no one's going to care about he's as far as the cops go he's not necessarily wrong what he's wrong about and we'll see in episode two is these women 
were beautiful people that were taken too soon and had loving friends and family that cared about them deeply. And if the cops weren't going to do something about it, by God, they were. Yeah, their families were going to do something about it. No, I agree. And I, I was reading my Zen book this morning talking about seeing situations and turning a blind eye to them where, you know, maybe you see an area of your city that's more prevalent to to substance users. You know, they all gather there and that's where they are using substances or where there's a, a particular stretch of road that sex workers, you know, part, you know pick up their their work on uh, if they're doing it not virtually or online, but not saying, oh, that's not my problem. That's not I'm not a part of that. That's I'm separate from that, like honoring that we're all one human. We mm -hmm. all are one bit of humanity. But when you say to yourself, oh, my uh, I'm one body, my heart hurts. Well, I'll just ignore it and maybe the problem will go away. It's like, no, you go and see a cardiologist, you go see a specialist. Or you say, man, I, my, my arm has got a rash on it. Well, might as well cut it off and throw it away. That's ludicrous. Mm -hmm. So in the same sense, when we see we're all one body, we're all one humanity, you have to understand that we're also all have different perspectives, have different experiences, and being willing to listen to stories like being willing to listen to Tiffany Taylor's story, being willing to listen to the families of Robin West and Joanne Brown and the additional victim in the next episode, Sarah Butler, listening to the pain that they endure and not turning away from it is the way for us to then say, okay, well, we have to address this. We can't ignore it. We can't simply say, well, I don't know any sex worker, so it doesn't matter to me. And it's like, no, you. it should care that any human is suffering this type of violence. And may I share with you some statistics about violence against sex workers in particular? Please. According to the Urban Justice Center, and this was a, a worksheet they, or a fact sheet they sent out on International Data in Violence Against Sex Workers. So it was December 17th, but I think any day is a, a fine day to address this. But sex workers are particularly vulnerable to sexual assault. Sex workers of color, migrants, sex workers, transgender sex workers all experience greater risks. According to a systematic review of research globally, sex workers have a 45 to 75 percent chance of experiencing sexual violence on the job. There's a stigmatizing notion that sex workers can't be assaulted. But they're, they can be, and they're usually left out of these conversations. And what I found very egregious was that sex workers are often ineligible for rape victim compensation funds or, due to the nature of their work, receive reduced amounts. They had just as much violence on them as anybody else, and they are entitled to less compensation. Because they're looked at as, well, you shouldn't have chose that line of work if you didn't want. This kind of comes with the job type of attitude. And when your job has been made illegal, then you say, OK, well, I can't go and tell police what happened to me because I'll be arrested. Right. And you think, oh, of course not. That wouldn't happen because, no, that's what happened to Tiffany Taylor. She had duct tape rips on her face. And they're like, oh, so why were you out there? Are we turning tricks? Maybe we should just arrest you. No, here's a fun fact. You shouldn't. You should probably help her. You should provide her with resources so she doesn't have to turn to that line of work unless she wants to. And instead, arrest the person who's out picking humans off and discarding them like freaking garbage. But that's why it's important to have these institutional systems where instead of every single time you get arrested for sex work, you just immediately say, oh, well, just throw them in jail and whatever. Who cares? Instead, you have courts in Dallas County. It was called the Star Court. And there's where instead of just going before a judge who goes, all right, what's your criminal record? Man, whatever. OK, well, I'm going to send you to jail. They say, OK, what resources do you need? Do you need educational resources? Do you need more resources to on the job training? Understanding where we as a society have failed certain segments of our society and saying we don't want to just cause problems by virtue of inequities and then ignore them and then go, ugh, whatever. It's not my problem. But where we go, OK, well, we probably fucked up. But all we can do now is move forward. And so courts that take things like substance use or sex work or what m polite society might want to turn away from and say, we're going to address this as the issue that it is and not simply simply criminalize it. I think we will see a trend toward more a people not having to turn to that line of work if they don't want to. And if they are in that line of work, when they are encountering situations like this, they have the resources, the means to 
be able to have every right that the rest of us have and not just go, well, I can't report it because I'm going to probably get busted or I can't report it because nobody cares. They thought I was asking for it. Well, it goes back to the whole Zen way of thinking. If we consider ourselves all one, then it's not just happening to someone that I don't know. It's also happening to me. And when you put yourself in that mindset of we're all one, so everything that happens to someone happens to all, then you become more compassionate and more empathetic and and sympathetic because selfishly, you're like, well, this could have been me in the Zen way of thinking. It's not selfish. It's the opposite (laughs) of that. But putting yourself in those shoes where you're like, this could be anybody This could be me. This could be my sister, my mom. Even if it's somebody I don't know, everyone deserves the same rights and deserves to be taken seriously. And have when they go to the police with all this evidence of something that just happened, they deserve for that to be looked into. Yeah. And considering it not just it could be my sister. It is. That is your sister. That is your mom. Mm -hmm. This is our family. Because we're all part of it. And so, and I don't want anybody to have that happen to them. And so what can we do then? And I said earlier, we did, we talked to uh, Bob Ruff from True Crime Binge earlier. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about, I was talking about how the, I was proud of the Dallas County Juvenile System. I'm also proud of the strides made in our community that we live in for recognizing, treating people holistically and not saying you have come to jail for this single crime of possession of a drug or you've come to jail for this single crime of solicitation but when crimes like this that are crimes of necessity what then are we doing to address these things and making sure that it's just not everybody in everybody out everybody in and of course it's not perfect we're not let me just say texas of all places is not the perfect bastion of the criminal justice system in America, but no. we live in a blue county, so Dallas County is not too bad. We try, we try. It's not perfect, but you try. So as long as you're trying, and I think being keyed into your neighborhood, at wherever you're listening from, listener, you know, you're keyed into your neighborhood, and how are the people who need the most help being treated where you live, and not saying, uh, well, I have it bad too. It's like, well, we all have different things that are different bad. Just because you have a cold and that guy has a broken leg, you're both there's both something going on. It doesn't mean that him saying, but I have a broken leg. I might need to be seen first. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And when you say, Hey buddy, that's my leg too. Uh, you go for it. <laughs> it makes us a lot less uh, self-centered and ego driven to go like, well, I got problems too. Well, yeah. What? Everybody's got problems. A little bit bigger. And uh, what do we say? If there's more helpers, then maybe we don't have to look very far for a helper. So figuring out what we can do in our own communities, I think is a big one too. But part two uh just get buckle up for that one too because there's you'll still get mad we'll get mad again we haven't solved all the problems at the end of part no, one but there's, there's also more. some some good stuff in part two yes. so we with will, our with the trial especially we'll break yeah. that all down and all the evidence we will get to that next week We love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost, so if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Rolling the Airwaves getting into a tier, special shout-out on the show, a monthly bonus mini-sode, and patron-exclusive video and audio content, including Am I the Asshole, Judge Christie, Relationship Advice, Dear Sinister, True Crime Headlines, and more. And patrons in the Getting Into It tier are also able to vote on a bonus content segment each month they would like to see us live stream. You also get to vote on a main feed episode topic. After part two of Khalil Wheeler Weaver, we will have uh, our Patreon choice. So keep your eyes peeled on Patreon over the next couple days. We'll get you a a little poll up so you can choose what our palate cleanser episode will be. Mm -hmm. You also have the fun perk of access to our Discord server where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We hop on occasionally, and we host monthly Q&As on Crowdcast, where you can ask us all your burning questions. For our patrons not in the U.S., you have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of the conversion fee. 
Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available. Those that select this option will be rewarded with the free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit Sinisterhood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. In particular, if you want to get probably the best looking t-shirt we've ever designed is our Sinisterhood cover photo logo tee. You can go to Sinisterhood.com and click shop on the top banner and order that sexy logo tee to wear to one of our live shows. Well, you can also get the tour shirt. It's not on there yet, but it will be coming soon. Keep your eyes peeled. Yes, and we will also have them available for sale at live shows. We're going to have merch this time. We'll have posters and T-shirts available for sale. We're we're growing. (laughs) Well, speaking of growing, the best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and follow on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. You can also share any episode by clicking the three dots in the top right corner and share topic-based playlists from Spotify by visiting Sinisterhood.com slash playlist. All of this means so much to us and really helps podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. We're also on YouTube and TikTok at Sinisterhood Podcast. Christy, where can everyone find you on the internet? I'm on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and Twitter and TikTok at Christy or GTFO. Heather? I'm on Twitter at MCK versus the world and I'm on TikTok and Instagram at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show. Here are your special Patreon shout-outs. Kristen Fields. Lori Seward. Mackenzie Trulio. Momo. Sophie Brooks-Mosier. g Lindsay. Alicia Hall. Michelle Wang. Lauren Garjulio. Ramsey Wilson. Andy Moore. Brooke Nix. Edna Valdez-Gilmore. Carrie Fullington. Diana Lindgren. Nichelle Schindler. Allie P. Paige Kalkagni, Jessica Homer, Rayleigh Rosenblatt, McKenna Groneveld, Melissa Upchurch, Megan Brosnan, Maggie Subert, Emma Maxwell, Katie Dune, Carrie Mayers, Brooke Gately Meyer, Evan Lee, Karen, Alexis, Tammy E, Sophia Lynch, Brooke Kinsman, Melissa Eli, Raina Tallabach, Eileen Reyes, Danny Paz, Sarah Espinoza, Mel Gibson. Surely not. <laughs> the best Mel Gibson is the one that subscribes to our Patreon. So you're the best Mel Gibson. Jenna. Nathan. Olivia Jolly. Anna Hartman. Katrina Troy. Tracy Pudlow. Stacy Mellinger. Bella Brosie. Bailey Carter. Jolene Lycan. Maddie Bryant. Hope Bray. Sherry Easterly. Leona Schultz. Jamie. Cameron Dale. And Jacqueline Eck. Thank you so much to all of you that support our Patreon. We could not do this without you. We sincerely love you, and we hope that we said your names correctly. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy. Mwahaha.